Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to see all of you here. Uh, we are so excited to see you again, even if just half your faces. Um, and those of you that are worshiping with us online, we're, we're excited to have you join us today. I'm going to ask if you're a guest with us today that you're going to text the word welcome to 720-575-5713. That's 720-575-5713. And that'll just be our way to connect with you this week. The pastors will reach out to you, see if there's a way we can be a blessing. We just want to get to know you a little bit, and we're excited to have that opportunity. Also today, we're going to welcome in just a second, I failed twice, so this is good that I have three times now. Th round three, is gonna, I'm going to be successful. Um, Charles and April are leading us in worship this morning, and I failed to mention them twice. So we wanna, we're going to welcome them this morning in just a second and be grateful that they're here to lead us. We're, we're super excited for that. Um, and then we just want to uh, have a great time of worship and celebration and honor our Lord. So let's pray, and we'll talk, start worshiping. Dearly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to worship you, Lord, whether it's here in this place together or those that are joining us online virtually with that technology, Lord, that's just so awesome that we can do that. God, we just ask that as we, as we start this service that you would prepare our hearts and our minds for worship and that we would bring you honor and glory. And then as Pastor Mark brings the word later, Lord, that your truth would just echo through our hearts and that we would leave this place or, or walk away from our screens transformed and ready to just get, grow closer to you this day. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's stand together and worship him.
and close their eyes. I want you just for a moment in silent prayer, just pray for the gospel to go out. Next, I want you to pray for injustice to end. Let's pray for God's people to be salt and light. This time as we pray, if you want to stand, you can stand, you can sit, you can sit, all those things would be good. Let's pray that we will be people who are gracious in our speech. Let's pray for us as a church to be different. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for to be able to be gathered here with God's people. What a blessing it is to come to this place in worship or even just to gather online. You are so good. You are so kind to us. Lord, we also want to pray, Father, for the gospel to go out. We know that Jesus changes hearts. But Father, we also know that, that narrow is the path, wide is the road that leads to destruction. And so we pray, Father, that uh, injustice will come to an end in our country. That we will not tolerate it, we will not excuse it, we will not allow for it. It will come to an end. We pray for God's people to be active, proactive, that we'll be diligent in our prayer, careful in our speech, and wise in our actions. Father, we're so thankful that you've made every single one of us, no matter our history, no matter the continent that we might be from, no matter what have you, Lord, you make us one in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, make us one today. Amen. All right, let's continue to worship together. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your 
of worship this morning. Thank you for God's people being together. Thank you for being in our midst. Lord, help us to trust you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, church family, if you would open your Bibles to 1 John uh, chapter 1. In a moment, we'll be in verse 5. 
Just as you do so, I've got a little bit of a story to share with you, and I, I just pray that you receive it in the heart I intend. It's not to uh, brag about something, but it's just sort of to, to illustrate that this is easier than what we make it out to be. Here's what I'm talking about. So, uh, this past week, I had a young couple uh, come into my office. She's a part of our church. He is not. Uh, and they came to me, and they said, well, we want to get married. I said, great. Uh, I mean, we'll just, we'll just walk right on past how quick this thing is, right? And that's great. It's awesome. You know, that, I don't know, that COVID is accelerating these sort of things, but it's very, very good. So we're sitting there, and we're talking, and we're talking about what it means to get married and all this sort of stuff. So I said, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, and he, you know, t- shared some about his past and where he's from and his parents and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then he go on to say that uh, he's a Christian. I said, well, that's good. I'm glad that you're a Christian. Um, let me just ask you, what does that mean? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, okay. So no big. I said, I realize you're talking to a pastor. Maybe it's a little intimidating. I said, but just instead of thinking of me as a pastor, imagine that I wasn't a Christian. And I just walked up to you and I said, how does somebody become a Christian? What do I need to do? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, okay. I said, we'll walk it through together. So I talked about the fact that, you know, every person uh, is sinful, and every person is born with a sin nature, and the fact that it separates us from God, right? So sin separates us from God, but God made a way for us, and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, to be raised uh, from the dead, and now, so we have to accept that we're a sinner, we have to believe Jesus died, believe Jesus rose again, and then we commit our life to follow him. And I said, have you ever done that? And he said, no. I said, well, do you understand that you're a sinner? And he said, yes. So do you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins? And he said, yes. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Yes. Do you want to commit your life to follow Jesus? And I just said, you know, it's kind of like saying, Jesus is my boss, and my boss tells me what to do, and I, you know, generally speaking, I do it, right? So, when do you want to make that commitment? And he said, today. So, whenever day that was, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm not 100% for sure, but in my office, we just walked through a prayer that says, God, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died. I believe Jesus rose again, and I commit my life to follow him, right? And I'm illustrating this a little bit for you just because I want you to know, I understand that the fact that our vision of our church is to have uh, 10,000 gospel conversations between now and, what was it, 2025, right? I mean, COVID maybe will impact that timeline just a little bit, and that's okay, right? But we're having gospel conversations between now and then. And some folks are like, man, I don't know, I've never had one before. And I just want to show you just a few simple questions, right, can unlock that conversation. You say you're a Christian, that's awesome. I am too. What does that mean? And he wasn't able to answer. So we just walked right through it. And I believe you guys know the ABCs. Do you know the ABCs? I'm not even, I don't even have expectations for you to get the Z, right? I just expect you to say A, B, C, okay? That's it. That's the gospel, right? It's a lot easier, although it's significant. It might be simple, right? But it's a significant decision. Just like I was saying, man, just like marriage, simple words are I do, significant commitment, right? Right? So we just talked through that. So the passage for us today talks about how the fact that as believers, we go from darkness into light. And so that happened this week, that this young man went from darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. Now, we also talked about, well, what does it mean to walk in the light, right? We're going to see those words today that John's going to have for us. And what does it mean to walk in the light? And so I just walked him through four simple things. Right, And I actually, because of your generosity, I was able to give him resources towards each end. So we talked about the fact that you should read your Bible daily. And I was able to give him a Bible, able to give him a Bible journal, and able to give him a bookmark with a Bible, you know, read through the Bible plan. And all it is is walking through the Gospel and then the letters and Revelation of John. So everything John had written. We then talked about prayer, right? So we say you pray consistently. And what the church would ask you to do this summer is to pray twice a day. Pray upward, inward, outward. Okay? In praise and confession and in request. We talked about the fact then that you need to participate 
weekly. And right now, participate means, well, watch online or show up in person, whatever you feel like is the most safe. But pre-COVID and post-COVID, this is not going to be something that changes, okay? People are saying we're living in a new normal. We're going to go back to this normal, that small groups will gather here in person. And I said to the young man, if you can give me one hour a week, I'd love to have two, but if you can only give me one, go to small group. Right now, I understand that it would be odd to just join a small group in the middle of uh, all this, and so just engage in worship, in person or online. And the last thing we talked about was we need to share the gospel regularly. Those four things, read your Bible daily, pray consistently, participate weekly, and share the gospel regularly. Do that and you're walking in the light. Now it assumes that you're a believer and that's a very clear thing that we need to assume. So John, for us, is going to talk to us today that as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to make sure that we're walking in the light. So let's read the passage along or follow along as I read it aloud. It says, This is the message we have heard from him. Who's the him? It's Jesus. And proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the truth of your word. We're so thankful that your word is always a help to us, that your ways are always good, your ways are always right. You are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. And we confess, Father, that we need your help today. We need your help just to walk through this passage and to apply it in our life. And even, Lord, we just ask one more thing. If there's someone here, or there's someone online, who is yet to make that same decision as that young man, I pray that today will be the day of their salvation. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So 1 John is written by John. We talked a little bit about this last week, but I don't want to assume that you were here last week, either in person or online, so give me just a moment. John was one of Jesus' disciples. John was fishing one day. He was cleaning his nets. He was in his boat. His dad was around and his brother too. And Jesus walks by and says, come and follow me. And John leaves his dad, his nets, his fishing. He doesn't get to leave his brother. His brother comes along, and they go and they follow Jesus for three years. Over the course of those three years, John is with him all the time. In fact, he is with him so often that he's known as the beloved disciple. He's a part of Jesus' inner circle. John was able to, just as he says in 1 John 1, 1, that he had seen, he had heard, and he had touched Jesus. We know that he was around him for three years. He was there at the cross when Jesus died. We know that because Jesus told him to go take care of his mom. We know that he was there at the empty tomb because he just happens to mention that he outruns Peter there. And then we know that he sees Jesus after Jesus is resurrected. And again, gets to see him, hear him, and touch him. So John has been around Jesus. He knows Jesus. He's familiar with Jesus, and we can kind of get that same sort of feeling of him, right? This is the Jesus that we sing, Jesus loves me too, right? He loves the little children, and we kind of get that picture of him in our head, right? But we also need to be crystal clear that Jesus, as John mentions, he was there with God at the beginning. He says this in 1 John 1, 1, and he says it in John 1, 1, that Jesus is God. He was with God at the beginning. He was God at the beginning. He created along with God. And so we, right, you might just say Christianity has got that new math going. We believe in a God who is three in one. Don't ask us to explain it. It's just something we believe. One God, three persons, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. And so the Son left heaven, took on human flesh, was born of Mary, lived a perfect life, died for us, and has been restored back to the Father. So when Jesus says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we have to understand that that means we give up our way, our truth, our life. People love to say, I have my life that I want to live. I have my truth that I want to believe. 
right? I have my way of going. And we just have to say, as far as Christians are concerned, we have to give that junk up. His way, His truth, His life, not our own. And so God, when God became human, it's a great reminder to us that humans cannot become God, even though we try to be the God over our own life. So John, for us, explains that to us. Really, it's the who of our faith that he explains in those first four verses of 1 John 1.1. He also explains to us a surprising why, the why of our faith. Now, for most people, you ask them, well, why would you be a Christian? Well, it's so that I could go to heaven for all of eternity. And I'm not saying that that's not the right answer. I'm saying it's not a complete answer. The complete answer John provides for us last week, and he says, we have fellowship with each other and with him. So we go from being in wrong relationship with God, in wrong relationship with others, and now when we become a believer of Jesus, a follower of Christ, we go from being wrong and into the right. Right relationship with God and right relationship with each other. That is the reason, right? Fellowship with one another. So we become Christians not just because we get to spend eternity with God, but because we get to spend today with God too. We get to live this life with him and for him. So those are the first two things that we learn from 1 John 1, 1 through 4. And so as we turn to today's passage, there's a new thing that we have to learn, new thing that we have to believe. And this thing, the first thing that we have to do is that we have to believe that God is light. That's our very, very first belief that we need to come to today. Now, this is a significant belief, you see, because so much of this world tells us that God is not. Now, let me explain. What does it mean for God to be light? Well, it tells us that uh, in verse 6, that if we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Well, if God is light, light means the truth because darkness means a lie. Are you following me there? So if if walking in darkness is walking in a lie, The fact that God is light means that God is truth. So we believe that God is light. And what that means for us is that God is truth. Now for some of you out there, you're saying, well, Mark, I I know that. I've been a Christian for a while. I get that. But I want us all to recognize something today. There is a point in our life, each and every single day, in which we don't believe it. You see, Satan wants us to think That God is a liar. And so throughout our day, every day, Satan tries to convince us that what God has to say about something is not the truth. In fact, that it's a lie. Let me give you an illustration. Okay? Just a real quick illustration. It's this. So when I was a kid, if you're you're a kid here with us, just put your fingers in your ears. It's fine. Um, I would break stuff. Right? So kids would break things. Right? We won't go into the one time that I lit a whole bunch of matches in the backyard. Like, we won't even go there, and then I skedaddled as soon as the flame got a little bit too big. So what happens next? Mom comes around. Mom comes, and Mom says, did you do this? What is my reaction? Right, so Satan in that moment is telling me, a lie is better than the truth. Because a lie is going to get you out of trouble. What Satan is doing in that moment is saying, you remember that command? Thou shalt not lie. You understand that truth is better? Well, right now, right this moment, a lie is better. And so I would tell a lie. And it worked out until one of my sisters came around. What did my sisters do? They ratted on me, right? Right? It was Mark. It was, that was their job, was to rat on me, right? And so, all of a sudden, the lie that brought me out of momentary trouble led to a lot more trouble. And this is true, right? In each and every way. And it's been this way from the beginning. And so, I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Genesis chapter 3, and we'll see the truth of this and how it's been true for a really long time. Satan wants to convince us that God is a liar. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, Moses is the one who writes this down, and Moses gives us an account that God has uh, informed him of, that God created the heavens and the earth, and he spent seven days to do it. And he just mentions the fact that on day six, uh, God created 
uh, humanity. He created male and female. That's what we're told. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, we're given a little bit more depth there. And so God creates Adam. Adam gets a little lonely. Adam has a little bit too much on his plate. He's not creative enough to think of all the names, and so he needs a helper. And so God gives him Eve. And then God says to them, you have one rule, right? You've got one commandment in this garden. And that is, do not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You do that, you're going to die. And so they're going about their merry ways, right? And then all of a sudden, Genesis 3 happens and says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall neither eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Boom. What is he saying about God? God is a liar. You will not surely die, for God knows, right? Now here's the temptation. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So hey, there's a benefit, right? Hey, Mark, tell your mom you didn't do it, and maybe you'll get away with it, right? So he says, So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her deadbeat husband who was with her, and he ate. My dad, when he would get home, and I had to fess up to him, right? That I was the one who told a lie. And he said, Bud, don't ever forget this. You can fool some of the people all the time. You can fool all the people some of the time, but... You can't fool mom. Every single time, you can't fool mom. So friends, this is sin. Sin is encountering something, right? So Satan telling us something, right? Whether it is uh, telling a lie, feeling jealous, getting angry, you know, all these things. Satan's going to tell us, act on those, and it'll be good for you. And it does feel good for a moment, but over the long time, right? Over the long term, it is ultimately not for our best. And so we can see we still feel the effects of Eve and Adam taking a bite of that apple. And humanity is broken. This world is broken. COVID exists because Adam and Eve took a bite. We still feel those effects of that to this very day. So every time that you are walking in your life and you are tempted, right? We're told in the passage, walk in the light, but there's times that we're tempted to step a toe over into the darkness, right? Because we start to believe a lie. And that lie claims that God is a liar, but God's ways are always the right ways. God's ways are always the best ways. God's truth is always the truth. God's commands are always for our benefit. There is not a time in history that it's been better to tell a lie than to tell the truth. There's not been a time in history where it was better to be jealous than to be content. There's not a single moment in your life that it is better to sin than to not. Ever a good thing for you. That's what he tells us to do. Instead, right, instead of believing a lie and making God out to be a liar, we are to walk in the light. That's what he says here, right? Back in our passage in verse 7, it says to walk in the light. That's his command for us. That's our second point for today. Walk in the light. Now, when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a family that went to church all the time. And so I'm confident that, you know, I was in a church uh, from nine months in the womb up until, you know, today, right? Right? I, believe, I think my mom has corrected me. I always thought I was in a Baptist church, but there was a little bit there that maybe they went to like a, a Bible-believing church and not a Baptist church. So, um, but from the time of one years old to today, I've been a part of a Baptist church. And here's what the Baptist church sometimes does that's very, very dangerous. Especially when I was a little boy. The Baptist church says, don't you want to, and you're talking, you know, you're talking to like a seven-year-old kid, right? You're like, don't you want to be a good boy? And at least back then, you were like, yeah, I want to be a good, good guy or whatever. 
They say, okay, good. You want to be a good person? Here's what you do. You don't drink, you don't cuss, and you don't go with girls who do. Right? So that was my Southern Baptist church, right? Small Southern Baptist church growing up. Just said, don't drink, don't cuss, and don't go with girls who do, and you will live a good life. It's like, all right. That's all it takes for me to be a Christian. Don't drink, don't cuss, don't go with girls who do. Now, Bryce, uh, Bryce grew up in an independent fundamentalist Baptist church. And so Bryce's list was longer than the Bible. And so a lot of things that he wasn't allowed to do, right? So don't drink, don't cuss, don't smoke, don't watch TV, don't, well, don't wear makeup, but that's an amen anyway, right? Don't, you know, and the list was long, okay? And here's the challenge with lists of laws. It's the same challenge that Jesus encountered with the Pharisees. Is you can get this list and you think that you are in right standing with God because you've followed this list. And so in that little Baptist church, I am sure, just like in every church across the world, that there are some people who think that they're good with God and they're not. And so they would go to church and they'd say, okay, I've checked, I've checked I've checked church off the list, and so I'm good. And I don't drink, and I don't smoke, and I don't cuss, and I don't go with girls who do. So I'm good, right? But what was the Pharisees, right? They had over 600 laws. The Pharisees became more passionate about the laws, and they became passionate about Jesus. Right? And those little Baptist churches became more passionate. It's not to say every little Baptist church. It could be really big Baptist churches too. But if that's the mindset, the danger becomes, here's this list of rules that I have to follow and that I am good with God. And I'm walking in the light. And so there would be people who would think, just like the Pharisees, I'm following the law, so I'm good. When in fact, you can look really good on the outside. You don't drink. You don't cuss. You don't go with girls who do. And yet on the inside, you're broken. On the inside, you're as far away from God as you could be. And so what does it mean to walk in the light? Well, first, we have to understand, we have to go from darkness to life, to light. You have to turn away from sin and turn to Jesus Christ. You have to turn away from a life lived for yourself, with your way, your truth, your life, and start living for His way, His truth, His life. In a sense, you have to turn from saying, I'm not a sinner, I don't need Jesus, I'm good where I'm at, and instead say, I admit I'm a sinner, I believe Jesus died, and I commit my life to follow him. We do those things, and we can, then we can walk in the light. And what does it mean then to, for us who have done that, right? For us who have done that, now how do I know that I'm walking in the light? And I'm just going to go back to those same four things that I talked about, because it's a really good place to start. Okay? It's a really good place to start. And here's one of the reasons why. Um, I'm glad uh, the Tremblies are here because it's uh, their uh, son and daughter-in-law up in uh, Washington or Oregon. It's one of those. One of those states. Uh, Their pastor had this to say yesterday uh, on Twitter. He said, Statistics show believers and unbelievers look exactly the same until a believer is reading the Bible at least four days a week. It's the very first thing. How do I walk in the light? Well, if you're a Christian and you want to walk in the light, you read God's Word. You read it every day. You read daily. What's the next thing I should do? Well, you should pray consistently, right? Right now we're saying pray two times a day. Pray inward, excuse me, upward, inward, outward, right? Praise, confession, and then in request. So read daily, pray consistently, participate weekly, in worship, in a small group, and then share the gospel regularly. You do those four things, and you're walking in the light. You're well on your way to being not just a new Christian, but a mature Christian. And so, friends, I don't care how long you've been in the light. If that's not a part of your life, reading the Bible, praying, participating, and sharing, start it today. Start that habit today. And then all of a sudden, you're going to discover that I'm walking the light. Of course, when we talk about reading the Bible, we talk about applying the Bible, right? 
When we talk about prayer, we don't just talk about just praying, hey, now I lay me, right? When we talk about participating, it's much more than just attending, right? And when we talk about sharing the gospel, all of a sudden you've gone from saint to super saint because so few people do it. So if you want to walk in the light, read the word, pray, participate, share. Now, all of you are saying, I have homework right? And all of you are saying, man, that's, that's a really high threshold. And what if I don't meet it? What if I fail? And what if I fall short of doing that? What's going to happen to me? Here's the beautiful thing. Whether it is in the, our walk with Jesus, or if it's when we, right, as we talked about earlier, believing the sin, believing in temptation, and believing that God is a liar, when we do those things, God has provided a way for us. And it's wonderful. Because God knows his creation, God knows his people. He knows that he couldn't just cleanse us once and we're set. That in fact, what we have to do, as 1 John 1, 9 says, that we have to confess our sins often. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's right there in our passage today. And so what we should do also is we walk out of this place, we say, okay, I want to walk in the light. What do I do? Confess your sins often. We like to think of this, and I think it's true that we like to think of this in the context of uh, our daily prayer time, right? That we offer up prayers of confession. And so we pray to God and we say, God, um, here's what I did wrong today, and I'm sorry. But I think that when we just think about it only in the context of prayer, that we're going to miss out on something that God intends for us to do. And I think it's a little bit because um, as Baptists, the idea of sort of going to a priest and confessing makes us a little bit nervous. And so we've lost out on the idea of confessing sin to somebody else. And we then think, okay, as long as I have confessed my sin to God, then I'm good. And I'm here to tell you, well, Jesus, what's, here's what Jesus says to us in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, and he's in Galilee as he's it, it, you know, preaching this sermon as he's explaining this. And he says, let's imagine that you are down in Jerusalem and you've brought your sacrifice and you're about to make your sacrifice that if you remember somebody you have wronged, leave your sacrifice and head back. Make it right. Come back here and offer up your sacrifice. Well, that's 80 miles. Now for us, some of us, that might mean uh, an hour and 20 minutes. Some of you, I know that means 45, right? But for them, 80 miles was substantial. Here's what Jesus is saying. You've already made the 80-mile trip. You've already done it with your family. You've already brought that unblemished lamb with you. Here's what I need you to do. Before you sacrifice it, haul back those 80 miles find that person, fix it, and come on back. You hear me, friends? You see, when we sin, sometimes the only person we sin against is ourself and God, right? And so we're able, right? If it's wrong thoughts, we're able to go to God and say, I, I, Lord, help me, right? But often when we sin, we sin against someone. Do we not? I mean, just for example, right? You know, I'm, I'm sitting there in my office, and uh, all of a sudden, someone, one of my boys runs down the stairs, right? And they come into my office, and they say, Dad. I'm like, yeah. And they say, hey, Parker punched me. I say, okay. Go get Parker. Parker comes down. Parker, you punched Jonathan? Well, yeah. But he punched me first. You're like, We'll go get Jonathan. Jonathan comes down. Jonathan, did you punch Parker first? Well, yeah. But he called me a bad name. Okay, go get, jo go get Parker. Well, come on down. You called him a bad name? Well, he called me a bad name yesterday, right? And that's how we live our lives, right? We live it in this giant circle of shifting blame. I did a wrong, and it was that person's fault. And we never say, I wronged you, I'm sorry 
Forgive me. And so then we go to God at our prayer time that night and say, God, this is so great. I confess my sin of losing my temper. Let's say at Jana. Let's say I lost my temper at Jana this week. And so I say to the Lord, God, forgive me for losing my temper and snapping at Janet. And then I walk out and I think I'm good. And I even think, oh, I've confessed my sins. He is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And I promise you that Jesus is sitting there going, yes, but leave your sacrifice at the altar, travel those 80 miles, and make it right. We cannot just confess our sins to God we confess our sins to each other. And so when I've hurt you, or you've hurt me, or I've hurt somebody else, we go to that person and we say, I was wrong. We might have a thousand reasons to be wrong. God doesn't care. Real confession is, I was wrong. Here's what I did. I am sorry. And it's just between that person and God whether or not they accept it. And we don't own it. And so friends, a part of confession is going to the person. When there is a person, when there is somebody that you can make it right with, you go to them, you tell them you're sorry, and you ask for their forgiveness. That is confessing your sins. It is confessing it to the Lord. It is confessing it to one another. Because remember, the why of salvation is what? Right relationship with God and right relationship with each other. And so when we lose our temper, when we snap, whatever it is, when we say an ugly word, we go to the person, we say that we're sorry, we ask for their forgiveness. We don't say, hey, I said this to you because you said that to me. Nope. We say, I said this to you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And friends, some of you aren't there yet. Some of you have gotten to grow. Read your Bible, spend time in prayer. But that's the goal, is to get to the point where we as mature followers of Christ, you want to know the difference? One of the differences between a mature follower of Christ and not, yes, it's sharing the gospel, but it's also the ability to go to someone and say without any sort of qualification, without any sort of shifting the blame, and say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Or when they come to you and say, you hurt me. You don't get to say, well, I, I hurt you because you hurt me. No. They come to you and they say, you hurt me. And what you do is you say, I hurt you. I'm sorry. We do that. And the church goes from a place of immature followers of Christ to mature followers of Christ. And I'm just here to tell you, it doesn't matter how long you've been in church, right? I've got 40 years plus nine months and COVID, all right? However long this thing has been, that my life has been in church. But until I can, without reservation or excuse, say, I was wrong, I'm sorry. I can't consider myself a mature Christian. And neither can you. doesn't matter if you've been in church for 80 years. doesn't matter if your church has been in 70 years or 70 times 7, right? doesn't matter how long you've been in church, how long you've walked with Christ. A sign of a mature believer is saying, I was wrong. I'm sorry. So friends, on this day we need to be crystal clear, right? We need to be crystal clear in this world because this world has, in many respects, is now starting to paint God as a liar. And they're saying, yes, I know that God's word says that, but that's not my truth, right? That's not my life. And so on that topic, whatever that topic is, whether it's a topic about finances, whether it's a talk about, topic about identity or sexuality or whatever, this world is now no longer just saying, well, that's just God's way, not my way. Now the world is saying that God's way is evil. And we have to be crystal clear, God's way is always right and it's always in the light. We all have to understand that if we want to walk in the light, and a Christian wants to do it, if you're here to say, I'm not sure I want to do that, then you just have to say, well, am I a follower of Jesus? So for a Christian to walk in the light, it's four easy things. Bible daily, pray consistently, participate weekly, share regularly. And then last, it's just this. 
Confession, yes, is to the Lord. Confession is also against those who you've wronged. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will see today where we've wronged someone and look to fix it. Lord, we confess that we need you. We need your help in this topic. And then last, Lord, just real quick. There's somebody online who has yet to place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. We pray that they will today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So friends, I want us, as, as Charles leads in song, here's what I'm going to simply ask for you to do. As he leads in song, and you're saying, yes, I've already walked from darkness to light, here's what I want you to do. One thing, before you start singing a word, which I know, that's a big thing because that's our habit, right? We just start singing. But before you start singing, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray to God and say, God, reveal to me that person that I've hurt, that I need to go to and apologize. They might be sitting on your row. I don't know. They might be here in the room. I don't know. But there's going to be someone that you need to go to and you need to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Don't excuse it. Just say, this is what I did. Whatever it was that you did, I was wrong and I'm sorry. But for some others, and I know that there are people in this room who have yet to place their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. And it's an, it's an interesting thing, right? So I'm, I'm talking to these people about marriage, and it's funny, right? You do a wedding, right? You do a wedding, and in the span of just a few minutes, you go from not married, you say a few words, you make a commitment, and then all of a sudden, what are you? You're married, right? So you're saying it before them, and, and you, whatever it is you do, right? So some, you know, weddings are weird now because there's not like just one way to do a wedding. But you, let's say you recite a few things, you exchange a few things, and you say, I do, and then I get to say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, right? And boom, you're married. That's all it takes. So as we talk about the gospel, I know that there's a temptation to think, boy, it's just a few words. Here's the deal. Going to God in prayer and saying to God, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And today I commit my life to follow Christ. Just a few simple words. But a huge commitment. So don't wait another day. Make that decision today. In fact, if you want to do that, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I would just simply ask for you to repeat it after me. And you, some of you might say, oh, it's just words. No, listen. Just like at a wedding, you just say a few words and you're married. In this prayer, you're saying a few words and you're committing your life to Christ. So if you want to do that, if you're going to say today is a day, enough is enough, now is the time. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their head. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes, whether you're here in person or online. And if you want to go from darkness to light, here's what you have to pray. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave. Today, I commit my life to follow you. Amen. It doesn't have to be perfection in the way you follow him. It's just faithful. So what I would encourage you to do is that if you're in this room and you made that decision, uh, the pastors will be, we're not going to have a time where you walk down front. We can't do that right now. But what we can do is we can encourage you to do one of two things. First, if you're here uh, in person, just come to a pastor after the service. We'll socially distance and we'll talk it through. Or two, if you are here in person or you're online and you'd rather just text, you'd send a text, just F-A-I-T-H, text FAITH to 720-575-5713 if you made that decision today or you want to make that decision. We would love to visit with you about it. 
This time, let me encourage everyone to stand. As Charles leads in song, and pray that prayer first. Who do I need to go to? Who do I need to confess my sin to? And ask for their forgiveness. Uh, as we have some video announcements for us today. Hey, church family, a couple of cool announcements that are coming up. The first one is we're celebrating our graduates, our high school graduates this year. Uh, I know it's kind of a crazy year for them, but we want to make sure that they're celebrated, that we recognize their accomplishments. So on July 5th, we're going to ask you to tune in for 11 a.m. service. We're going to celebrate them at that service. And if you're a graduate, please send me your pictures of your baby picture and your high school graduation picture, and we'll look forward to honoring you and celebrating you at that service. Also, we still need some tech volunteers, and if you're interested in helping out with the tech team and serving in that area, we'd love for you to participate. So I would ask you to email contact us at mabc.church, and we'll make sure that contact info gets to Michael Mon. Hello, church family. We've got an exciting announcement today that we are hosting our second annual He-Man MABC Golf Tournament on Thursday, August the 6th. We're so excited about this. We're hoping this can be a time of celebration as we come out of the COVID restrictions. And so we're asking you to come out and play, invite your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, get a team, go to mabc.church slash golf and sign up or ask us some good questions. We'd love to have you and look forward to seeing you out there that day. Church family, it's our summer of connecting our two by two by two, uh, two times a day, praying to God in prayer intentionally, two times a week, contacting a church member and two times in a month, reaching out to somebody uh, that is your one, that one person that you want to see become a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you have done that this past week, pull out your phones right now and head to mabc.church slash 2x2x2 so that we know that you've done this. Thank you. Hey, men of the church, I'm so excited to have an announcement for you today. We are going to be hosting a free Promise Keeper simulcast on Friday, July 31st and August 1st, that Saturday. We're excited about this opportunity. There's no cost to you. Come join us uh, as we worship with men in the church, as we have a great time of fellowship. All you have to do is go to mabc.church slash Ironmen for all the details and for a registration form. Please sign up and consider joining us, and we look forward to seeing you there. Good morning, church family. So grateful that you were able to join us for worship today, whether it was in person or online. Let me encourage you tomorrow to grab your phone, grab your tablet, go online and check out mabc.church slash RSVP and sign up for next weekend. Now, because Saturday is July 4th, we are not having a, a service on Saturday afternoon. We will have an 8 a.m. service on Sunday morning and an 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, we will make sure that the 11 a.m. on Sunday morning will be a perfect fit for you and for your kids. So we love you, we thank you, and we pray that you will have a great week. Going to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we again want to praise you. We want to thank you. We want to ask for your help. And Lord, just in this time of difficulty in our country, uh, Lord, we just ask for you to directly intervene. It's in your name we pray. 
Amen. For those of you online, thank you for joining us and have a good week.